Hey, voters, it's Jim from Ray Marine. It's Thursday night, and it's Ray Marine Live. Thanks for joining us tonight on the eve of Memorial Day weekend. We really appreciate you coming out and taking your Thursday night and giving it to us here at Ray Marine. So we've got kind of uh, an interesting session tonight. We're going to do some of the best of questions that you guys have uh, asked me uh, in the questions and comments kind of after the broadcast is over. So I picked out uh, five or six of them here that I tend to get over and over again. So we're going to recap some of those questions. That's also going to leave us a lot more time for you to chat in questions as well. So whether you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, feel free to drop a comment or a question in, and we'll try to take as many of them as we can in the next hour. Uh, so we're going to be looking at a bunch of different things tonight, including Axiom. We're going to be looking at some instruments as well. I have some I-50s and I-60s here. I'm going to show you, show you some cool integration uh, between those products. Uh, before we get started, though, just a couple of little news items um, here in the United States. This is Boating Safety Week, and of course, Memorial Day weekend marks the start to the summer boating season. So, of course, we want you to head out and have fun on the water this weekend, but we do want you to be safe as well. Uh, we love you as customers. We want to keep you as customers. So head out on the water, stay safe, enjoy your weekend. And also, being Memorial Day weekend, do take a couple of, of moments to reflect upon some of the amazing deeds and sacrifices that have happened in the past that allow us the freedoms that we have today and the freedoms to enjoy uh, this marvelous summer with our friends and family. So with that, let's get started tonight. Um, first up, I want to show you a feature that was um, requested um, actually yesterday uh, by a viewer. Um, and he wanted to know a little bit about the shallow water shading feature on Axiom. So I'm actually going to bring up my uh, chart here on my Axiom display. And Mr. Producer Man, you can go ahead and bring that up for us. And here we have a Navionics chart. So this particular shallow water shading feature is a Navionics feature. Uh, so what I am going to do is I am going to zoom in just a little bit for you. And actually, we're going to even come in a little bit closer to the coastline. We're probably going to have a slightly better setup for this feature, but let's take a look. Okay. So we are uh, in Boston Harbor again. You'll see we do a lot of uh, demos up here in this area, this neck of the woods. I'm familiar with it. So it just kind of helps me to find locations a little bit quicker for you. So shallow water shading is a feature that allows us to mark out um, the shallowest water with a red uh, speckle pattern or crosshatch pattern. So it allows you to define a no-go zone, if you will, on the chart. You're going to find it in the menu. So I'm going to use our uh, AnyDesk technology here. And I am. you can follow along with my touches. I'm going to open the menu on the chart. I am going to come down here to the settings menu, which is always the gears. And then we have a tabbed interface. So we're going to go to the Depths tab. And as we scroll down here, we're going to see a bunch of features. And one of the things you may notice if you are running uh, different types of charts on your system is that there are some features that are unique to Navionics. Uh, there are some features that are unique to uh, CMAP. There are some features that are unique to Lighthouse charts. Uh, this is where we are going to find them all, uh, all in here. Um, so let's see, uh, shallow water shading is right here. So I turn it on and when I enable it, you can see over here in my little preview window, I have red polka dots right now across my entire chart. And that is because we are showing shallow water in anywhere from zero to 32.8 feet. So if I want to tone this back a bit, I can scroll it down. And for example, maybe I'm going to have somebody in inexperienced at the helm with me. And I need to go down below. I need to get a drink. I need to make a sandwich. And I can say, Fred, take the wheel, stay out of the red area, knowing that anything that has that red speckle on it is in this case at 10 feet or shallower. So it's a way that we can create um, a marking across the entire navigation chart anywhere less than 10 feet right now is marked out with red speckle. So that defines kind of a no-go boundary. Now there was a, another uh, way that he asked me this question, but I imagine some of you probably have the same question. So let me talk a little bit about it. Um, what he wanted to do was to, uh, to define a no-go uh, no boundary 
uh, based on a report that actually the Navy uh, puts out, or the Coast Guard puts it out on behalf of the Navy in the area near where he boats. And um, uh, basically offshore, sometimes they do uh, they do testing, they do uh, gunfire, all this sort of stuff. So they'll set up uh, a box and they'll say that mariners need to stay out of this box at these coordinates between certain hours. Um, and, and it was an interesting feature. It's not something that we have in the system, but I thought I would describe it to you out there, kind of get your feedback on it, see if it's something you're interested in, um, because it's something I think would be worthwhile uh, for a, a future uh, enhancement uh, on the system, being able to basically define a shape or define a box, maybe add some colorization to it, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, but this is the most basic uh, go zone that we're looking at here. This is shallow water shading. Uh, but if you're interested in other types of no-go capabilities, drop some comments in down below. We'd love to take a look at those and see uh, what you think. So related to uh, shallow water shading, there's another feature on here called a fishing zone. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to zoom the chart back out a little bit. And we can probably bring the chart back up again. There we go. And I am actually going to switch from my navigation chart into my bathymetric chart. And I can do that over here by opening the chart menu. And I select fishing chart from my chart modes. One of the things you're going to see happen is the chart is going to refresh. So now we've gone from a navigation picture uh, to a bathymetric picture for fishing. So we have enhanced uh, depth contours and intervals and things like that in here. Uh, now, let's say, for example, the fish species that I'm going after, I know they like the water that is 25 to 35 feet. Maybe that's the optimal zone that I want to be fishing in. Uh, well, what I can do in here is I can go into my chart menu again. I'm going to open it up and I'm going to come down here on the bottom and go into the settings again. I am going to go into my depths tab. And once again, I'm going to scroll down and we keep going down, keep going down. I can define my fishing zone. So when I turn fishing zone on, I now have an upper and lower limit uh, that it's going to call out on the navigation chart for me. So right now it's set from uh, oh, just shy of 10 feet to 32 feet. Um, let's try setting this from, uh, let's go from 20. And we'll go to 30 feet. So you can see what it is going to do for me here. We'll even maybe tone this down a little further. It's not quite as deep in here as I'd like it to be. Let's go, yeah, let's go 15 to 20 feet. And there we go. So what it has done is it has recolorized the chart. And now any of the areas that are left in white are my preferred fishing depth. So these are my 15 to 20 foot areas uh, here on this stretch of Boston Harbor. Um, so this is really useful um, if there's a particular species you're targeting, you know it lies at a certain depth, uh, or maybe you are doing some trolling and you have uh, gear hanging over the side of the boat, you're dragging behind the boat at a certain depth, you wanna know what range uh, of, uh, or what location you wanna stay in so that you don't damage any of your equipment by dragging it across the bottom. Uh, you can certainly do that here as well uh, using this fishing zone. Um, and once you have it turned on like this, it actually applies across um, the entire chart. So no matter where you go, it is actually going to call out uh, that, in this case, 15 to 20 foot depth. And as we uh, pull over here, we'll take a look up inside the harbor. Again, all the 15 to 20 foot areas now are in white. Everything else is in blue. And it does still leave my shallow water no-go zone here uh, highlighted as well. So I do know the areas that for sure I want to stay out of. Um, so it's a great way to use those two layers together. Um, I see some questions in here kind of related to the data that we're looking at. Um, I see one there from Art, and I can actually grab it since I spotted it. I'll pull it up. Art Gauthier wants to know, does this bathymetric data come from USACE in the AICW? So USACE, I think, is U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. I'm not quite sure what AICW is. Uh, but this bathymetric data that we're looking at here does come from a variety of sources. I am sure some of it is from the Army Corps of Engineers. 
uh, some of it's from the Office of Coastal Survey. Um, a lot of it is also from boaters just like you. Um, we are looking at a Navionics presentation, so this um, can receive data from their sonar chart live uh, and their freshest data programs where you can record spot soundings, create maps, contribute them, and then share them with other boaters and you can get them back as part of your chart updates. Uh, so some of this is uh, user generated content, they call it. Uh, some of it is official government data and some of it comes from private sources as well. Um, you'll similarly find bathymetric data like this on um, our lighthouse charts. Um, you'll find uh, bathymetric data on sea map charts as well. And of course, there are some very specialized fishing charts available from companies like Strike Lines, Seymour, uh, uh, and standard mapping as well, depending on what area of the country you're in and what you like to do. Um, lots of great options for fishing. Um, Another one I see up there from Lefty K that is related to charting. Um, he's asking about the duck icon. And let me uh, explain what the duck icon is. Uh, let me see if we can zoom this out. If you could bring the chart back up again, let me see if I can get it to show the duck icons. Let me go back to a navigation layer. So what the duck icon is actually is there is an icon on the chart um, that is indicating some type of a restricted area. And sometimes you will see it. Here's one of them here. Let me see if I can highlight it with my mouse. Oops, I just lost it. Come back, come back. Depending on where you are, Sometimes there's a lot of these icons. Sometimes there's not very many. This is the icon that Lefty K is talking about right here. It looks like a purple duck. This is usually how people will describe it to us when they're asking what it is. Um, we can actually do a long press on it, and it'll tell us what it is. I can actually go to chart info, um, and it will tell me that we are in a restricted area, and it is an ecological reserve. That's actually what the icon stands for. Um, there is an option to turn those off because some areas when you go boating, there are tons and tons and tons of these duck icons all over the chart. And depending on the range scale you're at, uh, there could be uh, more or less of them as well. Um, so you can actually come in here to the chart menu. Again, come down here to the settings. But this time we're going to go to a different tab. We're going to go over here to advanced. And in the advanced chart layer, and these uh, this this um, whole menu now is customized to Navionics charts because we're running Navionics tonight. Um, when I come down here into um, all these different layers, advanced layers that can be turned on or turned off, um, the duck icons are part of the caution areas. And if I turn them off, you'll notice this little duck icon right about here. Um, it will turn the ducks on or off. Now notice it does turn off some other things as well. So there, a lot of those uh, might involve like traffic separation schemes or traffic lanes for offshore shipping. Um, they all turn on or turn off at the same time, but you do have the option uh, to eliminate them there um, as well as other things as well. You can turn off lighthouse sectors. You can turn off some of the shipping channels. You can turn off um, land-based features. Um, those are all controlled here in this advanced, um, advanced chart layers menu. Uh, what else we got for questions in there, Mr. Producer Man? Got a, another good one? We'll take one more and then we'll continue. When following a track on the Axiom, is it possible to see the heading of the course shown on the chart? There is a line to follow, but not a heading. So actually, I believe there is. Um, in our data overlays or in our data bars, um, we have a wide variety of data items that we can show. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do to see if I can make that happen is let's actually put a route into the system. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do a long press. I'm going to say build a route, and I'm going to make this one fairly simple just for demonstration purposes. We'll go over here, over here, over here, over here, and then I'm going to finish it. So it's just a fairly simple route, and now I am going to follow it. So we are actually now following a route, and let me see if I can bring up our next uh, heading to follow. 
So there's a couple things we've got going on here. This is a data bar. It popped up automatically because I started following the route. So here I do get the bearing to waypoint. So this is the active uh, destination. So my next waypoint, this one right here, is at a bearing 013 uh, from the boat. But I believe there is actually another data box I can turn on um, that will even give me the course uh, after that waypoint. So it's kind of like my next turn point. So let me see if I can bring that up. Now, all of these data boxes are individually editable. We also have these floating data boxes out here on the screen. We edit them all basically the same way. So I'm going to try to change this latitude longitude on the data bar. Um, I'm going to do a long press on it. It'll let me do it here with any desk. Will you let me edit it? Maybe not. I'm going to have to do this one with my finger. Let's see. All right, I do a long press on it. I'm going to say edit. And I think if I go down in here to my navigation category, I do have my next waypoint. Let's see, that names it by name. So now we know the name of my next waypoint. Let me just see if there is an option here for a, what have we got here? Waypoint, time to go, target position. Active waypoint, route ETA, waypoint ETA. Let's see what active waypoint is. All right, so that's giving me the name of the waypoint I'm headed to. That other one is giving me the name of the next waypoint in sequence. Um, I'm gonna make a note and take a deeper look at this one. Um, and what I will do is I will follow up with you on that. I'm pretty sure that there is a data box in here somewhere. Um, as you can see, there's quite a few. So when we go in and do any data box editing, they're all categorized in here. Um, and I think what you're looking for is in one of these categories. I'm just not quite sure which one it is at the moment. I thought it was in navigation, but it might be in a, hiding away in a different one. So let me find out the answer to that, and I'll post it back in the comments. Uh, what else do we have for questions in here? We'll take one more. Mark would like to know, can I change day to night colors on all instruments with one click? Um, that's a great question, Mark. Um, and the answer to that is maybe. Um, so there are certain functions that we can do system-wide. There are certain functions that we can do device by device. Um, so as an example, uh, let me bring both of my displays up so you can see them. Um, can we switch to the actual camera product cam? All right, so what I've got here on the desk in front of me is I have an Axiom 7, I have an Axiom 12 RV, and I have these linked together. Um, so if I, for example, change the brightness on one, it changes the brightness on both of them. So you can see the brightness is actually linked over the network, and I can go up or down. Um, if I change the display mode, the display mode will also change on my MFD. So here I've gone from daytime into nighttime and my F MFDs have followed. Now I also have out here some instruments. And let me see if I can get just a slightly wider view. So this bottom one uh, here is an I-50 Tri-Data. Um, it is networked to these MFDs. And what I wanna show you is that if I change the brightness over here, it does change the brightness of the instrument as well. So once again, through the networking, these are all linked uh, together. What doesn't change on these, and for that, let me show you this instrument up here. Um, this is an I-70 instrument, and it is in its version of night mode, but I'm gonna flip the MFDs back to daytime mode, and you can see it still remains in night. My MFDs went back to day, um, the night mode still remains up here on the instrument. So we can link the backlighting uh, together and go brighter or darker. Uh, the color palettes uh, currently do not shift, but that is something that we're taking a look at. The color palettes were kind of a recent addition on the MFDs. Now we just need to take it one step further, shift color palettes automatically on the instrument. So that's something that we will be taking a look at. Um, so I had this on my agenda tonight to show you how to set this up. So since you asked about it, this is actually a great time to bring that in. Um, a lot of people uh, don't take advantage of this feature, and I think it's actually one of the most 
useful things uh, on the system, especially when you have multiple Raymarine devices on your helm. Um, so this concept is called uh, network dimming. And um, we'll use this Axiom 7 as my uh, example unit. If I go into the settings menu and I go to the this display tab, you'll actually see right here um, an assignment where I can give this a display group. Um, so this one is right now assigned to display group helm number one. If I look at this big Axiom 12 over here, I'm going to go into its settings. I'm going to go to this display. And you'll notice it is also assigned to helm group number one. Um, and let me take this one step further. If we look at this I-50 instrument, oops, keep that in view for you. And I know this one is a little bit harder to see. Let me see if I can get the brightness down. That'll help you to see what I'm doing here. If I stop bumping the camera, that'll be even better. Okay. So on this I-50, if I hold these two buttons down for six seconds, I'm actually going to get to its version of display dimming. And this one is also assigned to helm group number one, um, as are all the other ones out here uh, right now. So because these are all part of helm group number one, what the system assumes is that they are all um, near to one another, and we want to control their lighting simultaneously. So because this is in helm one, this one is in helm one, and this one is in helm group number one, they will all dim together. Um, and I have that turned on right here. Shared brightness is turned on. Shared brightness is turned on on this one. And on this one, by enabling Helm Group number one, it also turns on shared brightness. So again, what you'll see, let's go for the wide shot here. When I bring up the brightness controls over here, you'll notice that they all change together because they're all in Helm Group number one. Now, just for the sake of something different, let's take this big MFD and let's say that this one is not on helm group number one, maybe this one is up on my flybridge, right? So now my big MFD is on the flybridge. This one is on main helm number one. This one is on main helm number one. And when I go to sync my brightness now, you'll notice that the MFD in the background there is now part of a different lighting group. Uh, so it does not dim with these ones. So it allows you to set up zones or locations on the boat where you have common uh, Raymarine devices. So for example, everything on your helm can be in one group. It'll all dim together. Uh, things that are on your flybridge could be in a different group. If you have a navigation station down below, maybe you've got a chart table and you have some instruments or an autopilot controller there, that could be a completely different zone. Um, and we do give you the flexibility to define the zones and you can run different color palettes and different lighting uh, levels um, in all of your different zones, depending on what you need uh, in those locations. All right, the next thing I wanted to show you tonight was uh, layouts and customizing. Now, this is a topic I know we've done it before, uh, but we seem to get a ton of questions on it every single time uh, we, we cover it. So I thought I would do it again, just to show you how we customize uh, one of these Axiom displays. Uh, so we're going to go back to the uh, the AnyDesk product camera. I think that'll give us the best view of this. So this is our Axiom 12 that we're looking at. Now again, all of these tiles that we're looking at, oops, we're still navigating here. Let me just get rid of that because that's going to keep annoying us the whole time. So when you want to end a route, just go to the menu. We go to navigation and we say stop. All right, now we have stopped navigating. All right, so back out here on the home screen, um, the set of tiles we're looking at here, these were you know, preset by one of our engineers who knows a little something about saltwater fishing, but he doesn't necessarily know how you do your saltwater fishing. So all of these tiles are completely customizable. You can put anything you want on any tile. Uh, we can carve them up into different combinations of apps. Um, and we have multiple pages of these available too. So you have eight tiles, um, on the main page. We have eight more tiles over here to the left, of which I only have four of them populated with anything. These ones are blank. And if I go to the other direction, I have another eight uh, tiles that I can do anything I want with. 
So on any one of these, if I just do a long press and then say customize, it brings up this editor for us. And this allows us to define what this tile is going to hold. So up here in this layout uh, selection, I can have a full screen uh, of any item, um, or I can have two apps side by side, top and bottom. I have three apps uh, with a large one to the left, three apps with a large one to the right, uh, three apps with the large one on the top, three apps with the large one on the bottom, or uh, four equally sized applications. So just for fun, I'm going to choose four applications. And now I use my selection of apps over here on the left to program the tile. And I can put anything I want uh, in here with a few exceptions. And it'll tell you if there is, there are a couple of apps on the system that have to be shown in full screen presentation. Uh, an example of that is the Yamaha engine app or the new Mercury engine app. Those need to be full screen. Um, the uh, um, Yacht Sense app, I think, also needs to be full screen if you have one of those uh, systems. So um, here I select what I want to put out here on my window pane. So I'm going to put uh, chart in the top left. I'm going to put radar in the top right. I'm going to put uh, fish finder. And I'm going to put my thermal camera into this four-way pane. Now, if I am satisfied with that, I can press next to move on to the, uh, the next step here. Uh, if I want to change one of these around, I can just go around one more time. So you know what? I don't want chart there. I actually want to have fish finder there. And I want to have fish finder there because I'm going to show two different sonars at the same time. And I want to put my chart down here so that I can see where I am on the on my navigation plot. And then finally, I want to put my radar down here so I can watch the traffic while I am fishing. And now that I'm happy with this layout, I can say next. I can call this whatever I want. The system defines it initially by the apps that you have chosen. We chose a combination of Fish Finder, Chart, and Radar, so that's what it named it. Uh, but if I wanted to give this a custom name, maybe this is my page. Uh, so this is now Jim's page, right? So I call it Jim's. And there it is, Jim's page. And when I open it up, I get my four-way split. Because it has sonar channels on it, and it is the very first time I am accessing them, it asks me what sonar I want to put into this window. Um, so I just press OK. It asks me to select where my sonar is coming from. So maybe I want to put down vision into that window, and it'll populate it for me. And then this window over here, I will say OK. And I'm going to make that one my uh, Real Vision 3D. And it'll populate that. Now, there's another customization we can do on these pages. Um, that is also, I think, very helpful. A lot of people don't know it's in there. Uh, we can change the ratio of these windows. So if I want the radar to be larger and everything else to be smaller, I can do that. Uh, if I want to favor the top half of the window versus the bottom, I can do that too. So where we change the ratios on this page now is in the main menu. We go into the menu. We come down to settings. And then we go to the settings for this page called page settings. And anytime you have a split screen window, you'll see this option to, e to edit the ratio uh, of the split screen. And now it's as simple as just dragging my finger on this blue uh, center arrow. And you can see that I can pull uh, the ratio out to wherever we want it to be. If I want to make that Real Vision 3D window a little bit larger, I could just pull it the other way. When I'm satisfied with whatever ratio I have selected, I can just hit the Save button up here. And that is now the, permanently the way that that page will be displayed every time it comes up. So anytime you have more than one application, you can use that ratio adjustment to show more or less of any particular app on the page just by dragging that center point around. So that's pretty handy. Um, I especially use that a lot when I'm looking at multiple sonar windows uh, at the same time. Um, I find that personally, I like to see my side vision and my down vision larger than my conventional sonar. Uh, so it's just a way that I can um, assign a little bit more screen real estate uh, to the apps that I am most interested in seeing. So let's go back out to the home screen. Um, another really common question we get 
um, has to do with our profile editor. And this is another pretty cool tool that's in there. Uh, some people make use of this, uh, some people do not. I will say if you have multiple people running your boat, um, it is a very, very handy feature to use. Um, if you have uh, if maybe a husband and wife team or you know, brother and son, and you have different ways that you like to visualize your electronics, uh, then this is definitely the tool for you. Um, so what the profile mode allows you to do is to basically create an account or a login on the system. It's, it's not uh, anything that you need to remember, uh, but what it does is it, it creates a set of custom parameters that you can access anytime you're using your MFD. So if we go back to the product camera for a second, let's take a look at our home screen again. And here on the home screen, you'll notice up here at the top, it says saltwater fishing. Um, this is the name of the profile we are running. So let me click on it. And it actually brings up our profile editor. Um, and Mr. Producer, can, for a second, can you turn off the, the live stream graphics? I think that's over in the banners menu. There we go. That'll help you see things a little bit better. So um, we're running in simulated mode and a simulator is a demo profile. And you'll see these on your system too. So this allows you to practice with your Axiom at home or offline when you're not out on the water. Um, I'm gonna click over here for a second and go to live profiles. So I've turned off the simulation on my Axiom and in a moment that'll probably disappear from the top. And these are the profiles that have been created on my system so far. I only have the factory defaults. So um, there's one called Skipper. Uh, there is one called guest. Um, so the skipper profile, you can keep it, you can edit it, or you can delete it if you don't like it. Uh, if you touch the little three buttons over here, um, I am actually going to change the name of this profile and I'm gonna call it Jim, so that's me. Now, anytime I use the boat, I'm gonna come in here and choose the Jim profile. Um, and when I select the Jim profile, any changes that I make to my icons are saved to the gym profile. Um, any changes that I make to the split ratios, to the data box overlays, to the color palettes, to the depth contour shadings, um, those are all saved to the gym profile. So anytime I access the gym profile, I see Axiom just the way that Jim likes it. Now, let's say, for example, uh, someone else uses my boat from time to time. Um, what I can do is I can create another uh, profile. So what it initially does is it copies my profile, assuming that maybe they're going to be similar, but they don't have to be. Uh, I am going to rename this one, and I'm going to call this one Judy, because Judy goes boating with me all the time. And if I want to get cutesy about this, I can assign Judy's profile uh, her own icon, whatever I want it to be, just to give it some differentiation. Uh, we're going to give her the skull and crossbones, because why not? So if I go into the Judy pattern, uh, excuse me, the Judy profile now, and I make changes to things, you'll see I am logged into the system as Judy, and maybe Judy never goes fishing. Uh, so I'm gonna customize Judy's tile, and I'm gonna put radar in that one. And I'm just gonna save it. I'm just gonna do a couple things on it here to make it uh, noticeably different from my profile. So Judy likes to read the handbook, so there's the PDF viewer. Uh, Judy likes to fly her drone. So there is the UAV app. So there are, here's Judy's uh, preferred apps here on the top. But what I wanna show you is that when I change profiles and I go back to the gym view, there's all of Jim's apps and Jim's settings are all saved. Or when Judy takes the helm, now Judy has all her stuff right here at her fingertips. So it's a very, very handy way uh, for people to customize the system uh, and not mess with other people's settings. I know some people are very sensitive to that. One other thing um, that is cool with this profile editor as well uh, is there is a guest profile on it. And the nice thing about the guest profile is that any changes that are made to the guest profile are not saved. So like when you, um, you, know, you do your buddy down the block a favor and you take his nerdy kid out fishing for the afternoon and all he wants to do is push the buttons on your electronics, guest profile, that's where you want him to be. Uh, he can push buttons and do things to his heart's content. And when you exit the guest profile, it is not saved. Uh, so uh, keep that in mind if you get someone that's a, a button presser and you're afraid they're gonna mess with your stuff, uh, put them into the guest profile. It's a great way to do that. 
So we're going to go back into um, the simulated or demo profiles. I'm using the saltwater fishing demonstration. So once again, it's gone back now to these pre-configured screens. It gives me my simulated data that I can show you uh, here tonight as well. Um, let's take uh, a couple more questions. What do we have that's new? David would like to know, is there any way to get tracks back that were deleted by mistake? Uh, unfortunately, there really is not. Um, so let me show you where the tracks are actually saved. Um, on your home screen, there is a button called My Data. Let me click it with the AnyDesk so you can see my finger presses. So when I go into My Data, <clears throat> we have categories for waypoints, routes, and tracks. And I'm going to bet I don't have any tracks going. So let's uh, let's start a new track. So I do have the track plotter running. So while we're in here and the track plotter is running, let me talk a little bit about track interval, because this is another very common question we get. And it was on my list for tonight. When you are recording a track, that is, the boat is dropping breadcrumbs behind it, so you can see where you have been along the way, by default, Axiom automatically manages the dropping of those breadcrumbs. And what it's trying to do is it's trying to optimize the amount of space in the track record file. Um, any recorded track can have 50,000 points in it. Uh, those 50,000 points can be very, very close together and give you a lot of detail, which uh, is going to eat up those points faster. Uh, they can also be spread out over longer distances so that you can cover much more ground. If you're going transatlantic, for example, and you're doing long, straight courses, you may not need as many breadcrumbs uh, to define your, your track. So it can record for days and days and days at a time and not use up those 50,000 track points. So with automatic management, it kind of intelligently looks at how fast you're going, uh, how often you're changing course, um, and it adjusts the track interval. What I find in the real world is most people want to have as much detail as possible. Most people that are running the track recorder are doing it because they truly want to see where they have been. They want to see uh, a very defined track line with maximum detail. So if you go in here to this uh, record by, we can go to a time or a distance-based interval. If you go to a time-based interval, then you have some selections here. So right now, the breadcrumb dropper is dropping a fresh breadcrumb every 30 seconds behind the boat. Um, if I want more detail, I could go to a smaller interval, so maybe five seconds, or I could even go to a two-second interval. Uh, you guys down in the southeast that are going into uh, going flats fishing, you're going back into the bayou, uh, I would go to a time-based two-second interval absolutely to get maximum track detail. Um, you can also do a distance-based uh, interval as well. So we can just change here, uh, record by distance instead. And again, the interval changes. You can have you know, anywhere from 120 foot spacing, which is um, my guess is probably 10 meters. That's why we get that kind of oddball number um, uh, out to one mile uh, between uh, points. So it's your choice how you want to do it. Um, personally, um, I am a small boat guy. I go into lots of little tiny skinny water places. Um, I prefer to use time-based interval, and I use a very, very small interval as well. I'm usually on a, on a two-second uh, interval, but I don't keep my tracks for any extended length of time either. I, I usually reset them every day uh, or every other day, uh, so that 50,000 track points, you know, that'll cover me for, for longer than I care to be out on the water uh, at any given time, um, even with that short uh, interval. So uh, your original question about the track, so as... Um, We've been running along here and dropping some uh, some track points in. Let me um, let me close the window here. Let's go back out to the chart. Oops, the chart which I edited away. Let's make a chart window real quick here. Customize chart. Next, save chart. All right, so here is our chart display. It is starting to populate up uh, for us. There is the track recording, the pink line uh, behind it. So just to show that we have been recording some data here. And you originally asked, is it possible to recover these things if you delete them by accident? Uh, the answer to that really is no. Um, 
Ooh, let me show you where it's saved now. So now that we have a track going on the system, um, I can even come in here, waypoints, routes, and tracks, or I can go back to the home screen, uh, go into that My Data, and then into Tracks. It takes you to the same place. So here's our track that is running. Um, if I stop it, I have a choice of what I want to do. I can save it, I can delete it, or I can cancel and continue tracking. So if I save it, it is going to save it off uh, to memory. Um, if I do try to delete this track, it does give me the are you sure. So definitely, if you're going to delete something, pay close attention to what it is you're deleting. Um, and this is your last chance right here. And if I say yes, uh, that track is neutralized. It is now gone. Um, and there really isn't a way to recover it. Uh, what else we got for questions in here? Mahi Mountain Outdoors. Oh, that's a great avatar you got there. I just installed a Raymarine Magnum Open Array Radar. Do I leave the switch on the pedestal turned on all the time? Uh, great question. Yes, you do. So on the back of a Magnum Open Array Radar, there is a little toggle switch. It's got a rubber boot on it, uh, but it has an on-off on it. It's called an antenna safety switch. Um, you're going to leave that on all the time unless someone happens to be up there working around the radar. And what that is, uh, is it's a, basically a local uh, lockout so that, um, I don't know, if I'm up there cleaning or I'm up there doing some kind of maintenance or whatever, if someone down below doesn't realize I'm up there, they don't accidentally turn the radar on and knock me off the hard top of the boat and into the water. Um, when they flip that switch, it actually prevents the radar from spinning. Uh, it does prevent it from transmitting as well. It basically knocks the radar out. It won't, will not start up if that switch is in the off uh, position. Um, that also kind of leads to another point is sometimes what will happen is when people are washing their boats down at the end of the day, or if someone had been up there working, they forget to flip that switch or they accidentally bump the switch into the off position and all of a sudden their radar doesn't work and they're not sure why. Uh, definitely take a look and see if that switch got moved. Uh, I've seen uh, more than once where that switch gets, actually gets bumped with the mop or the, uh, the boat brush um, and you don't realize it, you turn the radar off um, and it won't spin up. And uh, you'll get a message on the MFD. It'll basically say that the, the scanner's not responding or the scanner's not available. Uh, check, check the switch. That's always the first thing to look at. Christian G, what is the difference between the Quantum 2 Doppler radar and the RD424HD? I purchased the RD424 because that was my only option at this time last year. I wanted the Quantum 2 Doppler radar. Okay. So the, uh, the two radars you have there, um, they fundamentally do the same thing, but they have some different features and different technology in them. So let's start with the RD424 HD. So that is what we call an HD color radar. That radar is a magnetron-based radar. So it's a pulsed microwave uh, radar with four kilowatts of power uh, and a 48 nautical mile maximum range. So the magnetron technology uh, produces a very, very strong uh, magnetron pulse. It's uh, about 4,000 watts, 4 kilowatts. Um, and being a, an HD color radar, it can do some pretty cool things. Um, that radar has bird mode in it, so it can actually optimize itself to look for seabirds. It has dual range capability, so you can scan a long range and a short range at the same time uh, on that radar. Um, it has, uh, what else is unique to that? It has... Um, uh, it has a uh, dual speed mode as well. It has 24 or 48 RPM scanning. So at shorter ranges, it'll spin faster. Um, at sh longer ranges, it'll spin slower, though it's inside the radome. You can't see it, but it does, it does do that. So if we take a look at a Doppler radar, a Quantum 2, a little bit different technology. So Quantum 2 uses what we call a uh, solid state uh, uh, chirp pulse compression radar. Uh, so it's a different kind of technology. It is lower power. So a uh, quantum two is uh, in the neighborhood of about 22 to 25 watts of power uh, versus 4,000 watts uh, over on the RD424. Uh, different kind of technology, uh, but it does the same job in a different way. So with less power, um, it has a 24 mile range. Um, but what, uh, what quantum does that's kind of unique is it has Doppler processing. So what Doppler does is it actually uses that specialized uh, signal that it sends out and it looks for pitch changes in the return echoes. And basically, um, uh, if you remember all the way back probably to, uh, I don't know, middle school science class, 
they always used to talk about the Doppler effect and they would use the example of a train horn. And as the train is approaching, uh, the sound of the horn shifts in phase and gets louder. And then the sound of the horn drops off in pitch as it gets farther away. Well, that's actually what a Doppler radar is doing as well. Uh, it monitors the frequency of the returning echoes and it can determine if that target is moving towards the radar or away from the radar and it color codes it accordingly. Uh, targets that are inbound are color coded in red. Uh, targets that are outbound moving away from you are color coded in green. And then any other target is uh, usually on a third neutral color, typically a gray or blue or something like that. Um, so the Doppler radar is really good for collision avoidance and uh, kind of coastal navigation, uh, picking out moving objects versus stationary objects. Uh, the RD424HD um, doesn't have the color coding capability, but it can do um, a lot of the coastal navigation and collision avoidance stuff uh, in different ways uh, from, the, from the quantum. They're both great products. Um, they both have uh, some unique capabilities to them. Um, and I don't think you really could make a bad choice either way. Um, if you want a little more information about what you have and how you can apply it to your boating, uh, Christian, certainly drop a comment in down below and I'd be happy to follow up with you on that. I see another question in there from Alan Hendry. Let's grab that one because I think that's kind of a cool question. I'll pop it up here. Is there any way to control the alarm volume? Um, Alan, that's a great question. Um, and a lot of people ask this question of us. Uh, so your MFD has its alarm mode built in. It's got a little uh, piezo speaker in it that's, uh, that's pretty, pretty loud. Um, instruments have uh, an alarm in them. Um, and the alarm level of those is pretty much fixed volume. Um, they, they, they sound at basically one volume level. There are some variations in the alarm depending on whether things are critical or informational in nature. You'll hear some different patterns uh, to the beep, uh, but the beep is pretty much all the same. The thing that most people are looking for is a very loud alarm. Uh, maybe they're looking for something like a watch alarm so that if they are single-handed sailing or they're alone on the boat and they're just away from the helm, they wanna know right away um, when something is going on, when an alarm is triggered. Uh, we do actually have an alarm repeater module as an accessory. Uh, it plugs in on the SeaTalk NG network. Uh, and I don't know the exact figure off the top of my head, but it is loud enough that uh, you would not wanna be in a small enclosed space when it goes off. Uh, if you're asleep in your bunk, it will definitely wake you up. Uh, it's extremely loud. Another option that is very cool um, on all of these Axiom displays, and if you could bring my uh, product camera back up, um, bring up the AnyDesk one. Um, I am going to exit out here to the home screen. And Axiom displays all have uh, Bluetooth on board, and they do pass Bluetooth audio. So you could actually take the alarms from your Axiom and send them uh, over Bluetooth. So you would literally come up here to, this is the status menu on the top right-hand corner of the screen. Hit the little three dots here and you'll see this Bluetooth settings menu. When we pop this open, um, it will actually look for Bluetooth devices. So if you have a stereo on board the boat that has Bluetooth, uh, if you have a little portable speaker that has Bluetooth, maybe you got like, one of those little JBL clips or you know whatever your favorite little Bluetooth speaker is, um, you can connect that to your Axiom um, and send the alarms via Bluetooth to that speaker. When you send it to a Bluetooth speaker, you do have volume control available. Um, so assuming that I connected to a Bluetooth speaker, and I don't have one here in the studio to show you this, um, but once you are connected to the speaker, you, you, you just pick your device uh, off the list and connect. Um, you will get a volume control down here. So what I did is I swiped the, um, the power key. And in that pop-up menu that pops up, down in this area, right about here, if I were connected to a Bluetooth speaker, you would see uh, an alarm. Uh, actually, you'll see two sliders for volume control. One of them is for system alarms. Um, the other one is for uh, for audio, for music, because uh, you can also use that Bluetooth audio out if you're running the Netflix app or the Spotify app from the Raymond Apps menu. So you have independent control over uh, like your entertainment volume versus your uh, alarm volume. Um, I'll try to bring a Bluetooth speaker into the studio on one of these future sessions uh, and show you how that works. But uh, I think you'll see it 
as soon as you connect up. And again, just remember that your Bluetooth controls are up here on the top right. Uh, hit the little three dots on the status bar, uh, Bluetooth settings. And uh, if you need to turn the Bluetooth on, I think it's on by default, but uh, if it was off, this little toggle turns it on and then it'll scan uh, for whatever Bluetooth device, devices are around you. And depending on what they are, it'll, it'll name them, you know, just like uh, on your, your Android or Apple phone, you'd see your headphones or you'd see your Bluetooth speakers. Uh, you'll see your stereo head unit. We've got Rockford Fosgate, Fusion, whatever. Um, you can connect to that too. All right. Uh, let's see if we have, now yeah, let's see if we got one more question in there. Jim would like to know, if I have linked axioms, one at the helm, one at the nav table, do I need separate Navionics cards for each? Uh, the answer to that, Jim, is no. As long as you run a network cable between your two axioms, uh, they will share cartography across the Raynet Ethernet connection. Uh, so the card can be plugged in at either axiom, but it is visible on both as long as they're both switched on. Um, you can also have uh, different cards in different axioms. So for example, I could have a lighthouse chart in one and I could have a Seymour or a strike line specialized fishing chart in the other. And both of those charts are available to both axioms. So they'll share it back and forth across the network. All the charts are served uh, that way uh, to all the axioms on board. Um, I had a couple of other things here that I wanted to talk about. I've just got one more. Um, we get a lot of questions about the Axiom UAV app. And the UAV app is Unmanned Aerial Vehicles, better known as drones. Um, and it's something we rolled out a couple of years ago. And there's a small community of people that are using it. They seem to be having a pretty good time with it. Um, and the question that we always get is what models of drones does our system work with? Uh, and there's basically four of them. Um, there is the DJI Mavic Pro and Mavic Pro Platinum. In fact, the one that I have here behind me on the desk, it's a little bit older one, but this is a Mavic Pro um, uh, drone. So it has 4K video camera. Um, this has about a 25 minute flight time. Um, it links right up to Axiom very, very easily. Uh, I believe this one is still available, but if it is not, um, the other drone that we work with is the Mavic 2, which is basically the model that followed uh, this one. And it comes in two versions as well. There's a Mavic, uh, Mavic, Pro, uh, Mavic 2 Pro and a Mavic 2 Zoom. We can work with either of those uh, drones. Um, the setup is actually fairly easy. Your Axiom does need to be connected to the internet the very first time you try to use the DJI app, uh, but only the first time. And that's because it does a one-time authorization with a server uh, that they run uh, to unlock uh, some software code that belongs to DJI. Um, but once it is unlocked, you don't need internet access anymore on your MFD. So the first time you do it, you'll want to maybe activate it at home. Uh, at your home dock or in your marina or use your wireless hotspot to turn it on. Um, and then the connection is actually just a uh, USB uh, connection between your drone's controller uh, and the back of your Axiom display. And it'll come right up in the app and you can control it from there. Uh, we'll try to do a little bit more in-depth uh, demonstration of how to set that up in a future episode. I see we're coming up towards the end of the hour. Uh, I think we've got time probably to, for a few more questions. Um, we definitely want to give as much time as possible to your questions tonight. We really appreciate you coming on on this Thursday night. Uh, I see one there from Todd, uh, Ron, Ron Mitchell. Okay, we'll take that one first and then we'll cue Todd's question up next. How do you get to the Mercury page? So in the last few weeks, we announced um, compatibility between Axiom and Vessel View Connect which is a new system that Mercury uh, has just started rolling out. Uh, so if you have Mercury engines and you want to see your data in an official Mercury Vessel View presentation on your Axiom screen, uh, there's two pieces of the puzzle. Um, the first piece is software that lives in your Axiom. And you can get that software for free by updating to Lighthouse 314 Fremantle. That is our latest uh, and current release. Um, available on raymarine.com or through your uh, online software updater on Axiom. So uh, let me show you how you would access that. Um, so the first thing you need to do 
is in your system settings. So from the home screen, go into settings. Uh, go to your boat details. This is where we tell Axiom all about your boat and how it is configured. And right here, you will see engine manufacturer. Uh, so you will come in and you will select Mercury. And this tells Axiom that it is now looking for a Mercury Vessel View Connect gateway out on the NMEA 2000 network. You also will need to tell it how many engines you have on board your boat. And Vessel View Connect supports anywhere from one to four uh, Mercury motors. So you pick the number of motors you have. Um, I bet Ron's probably got four motors, maybe more on his boat, but we'll go with four. And uh, then we're gonna exit out of here so that we have defined that we have Mercury engines and we have four of them on board. Now to actually get the Vessel View app, we need to do an edit on the home screen. So just like before, I can pick any one of these tiles. I'm gonna do a long press and say customize. Uh, I'm gonna make this a full screen because Vessel View is required to run in full screen. And I scroll down here in my list of available apps to program and voila, we have Mercury Vessel View. And I say next. And it by default calls it Vessel View. And now it is available on my system. And when I open the app, I am going to get a preview of it here. And I have set this up for a four engine configuration. So the way that Vessel View shows four motors simultaneously is it nests them together. So if you notice on my left hand gauge, I have P and PC. So I have port and port center. Over here, I have starboard and starboard center. And if I had live data on the system, um, I have everything I need to know uh, right here. I have RPMs. I have whether I'm in forward, neutral, or reverse. I have uh, fuel burn. I have tank levels. I have speed. Um, so the reason that this says no communication on it is it is looking for a particular piece of hardware. It is a new uh, device called a Vessel View Connect Gateway. Uh, it is from Mercury, so you'll need to order it up through your local Mercury dealer or through their parts counter. There's four versions of it. There are two of them for single outboard systems. Uh, one of them is for uh, an under the cowl connection. The other is for an under the helm connection, depending on uh, how your, end, your particular uh, outboard is set up. Uh, then there is a Vessel View Connect device specifically for dual engines. And then there is a fourth model that supports three or four outboards. Uh, so you do need to order the, the correct one uh, for your boat's setup. Um, this integration with Mercury is very particular. They require you to use uh, this Vessel View Connect gateway. So if you have some other Vessel View display or some other piece of Vessel View hardware on board your boat, um, even ones that output NEMA 2000 or Bluetooth or things like that, uh, they will not work with this app. Uh, Mercury wants you to have that specific Vessel View Connect gateway. Um, I have seen them start to pop up online, uh, available to order from Mercury dealers. Um, so I believe those are going to ship almost uh, any day now. Uh, but definitely check with your dealer. Um, we will have some more information about it up on raymarine.com, and we can get your part numbers or whatever, too. Um, if you have particular um, uh, questions about it, certainly drop a comment in below, and I can follow up directly with you. Uh, what else have we got? I think we've got time for maybe one or two more questions. Christian, can I get AIS targets to show up on the radar display? Uh, yes, you can. So to get AIS on your Axiom display, uh, you do need to have either uh, an AIS receiver or an AIS transceiver. Um, you also could do it with a VHF radio that has onboard AIS. So something like our Ray 73, our Ray 91 radios, they have AIS receivers built in, so they do dual function, uh, but assuming you have one of those devices networked uh, to your system. Um, if you want to see AIS targets on your radar, here's how you do it. So over on your Axiom, uh, let's bring up the product camera again. We would go into the radar app. And when the radar app opens up, I have a menu up here, just like I have on all of my other apps to get into my system settings or, or excuse me, my app settings. And AIS is hidden here in the targets layer. So I go to targets, I can go to AIS settings, 
And right here, show AIS targets in radar. So when I flip that toggle switch, my AIS targets will magically appear. Um, you have the choice of showing standard AIS targets or enhanced targets. So the enhanced targets are the ones we see here. They have a little bit of definition and character to them to kind of discern what types of boats you're looking at. So there are unique uh, icons for uh, passenger vessels, for high-speed craft, for sailboats, for commercial ships, uh, for first responders. Uh, so if they have identified themselves in their AIS broadcast as a particular type of vessel, you'll get a, a slightly more distinct uh, icon. Um, if you want to keep it simple, you can turn that off, and then all of your AIS targets will just show up as triangles. Um, they will still have varying sizes of triangles because AIS does report the length of the vessel. So depending on whether it's a small, medium, or large vessel, you may get a small, medium, or large triangle. You also have the option to turn on or turn off the names of all of these vessels. So if you want to see boat names or ship names, you can turn them on or you can turn it off uh, to declutter it a bit. You also have the ability to do some uh, constraining of what is shown. You can show everybody. You can show only targets that are dangerous. So if they are going to be crossing your path, if they're going to be coming in close uh, to your safety zone, um, they would be designated a dangerous target. The icon will change from green to red and it will flash and it will show it to you. Um, you can also designate targets as buddies. So if you have friends that are boaters and you know they have AIS or you know there's another charter captain out there that you're friendly with and you want to always know where he is and he wants to know where you are, um, you can actually pick him out on the display, designate him as a buddy, and it'll give him a yellow icon as opposed to a green or red. Um, so that is uh, the buddy uh, system there. And this final setting for AIS on radar, and you'll also find all of these on chart, the chart plotter as well, um, is the ability to hide static targets. So if you turn this on, um, any AIS contacts that are moving at two knots or less will be hidden. Uh, a lot of people leave their AIS on when their boat is in the slip at the marina. So you go by a marina, there could be hundreds of AIS contacts all just there, uh, not doing anything. If you turn uh, hide static targets uh, on, it'll, uh, it'll keep all those symbols off the screen. It kind of declutters it a little bit. So that's where you would find AIS on your radar. And it looks like we are an hour and two minutes in. So we are probably going to wrap for tonight. Um, again, if you have questions or comments, um, we try to take as many of them live as we can during the broadcast, uh, but obviously we can't get to all of them. So um, I will be in the comment feed later on and tomorrow. Uh, and I would try to get an answer to every single comment or question that is posted. So certainly feel free to, uh, to drop any feedback in there. Um, if you need uh, a, a, a personal uh, call or follow-up, um, you can also send us a private message uh, via Facebook, uh, and uh, we get in touch with you that way. I want to thank you all for joining us. Uh, one little final uh, programming note. Um, for the next uh, few weeks, anyway, we are going to be uh, dropping to every other Thursday night. Uh, so we will be off next Thursday. We will be back with our next episode on June 10th. Uh, so definitely kind of keep that in mind if you've been a regular viewer. Uh, we're giving you next Thursday off, so we can also take next Thursday off. Uh, but we will be back in two weeks with the next episode of Raymarine Live. Uh, we love to hear your comments. We love to hear your feedback. For those of you that are watching this as a replay, again, feel free to drop comments in. I watch these all week long, and I try to answer every question that is posted. So until June 10th, when we return, uh, have a safe and wonderful Memorial Day holiday weekend. Thank you for joining us again for Raymarine Live. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.